All right, let's take a look at a truss so I can walk you through how to identify zero force members. Now, at first, this looks like a big truss. I mean, there's 21 members here. But as you may have guessed from the title of the video, some of these members don't have any force in them, which means this truss isn't actually that hard to analyze. Now, I'll get into why we have beams with no force in them in a minute. But first, let me show you how to find these zero force members. See, let's look at the intersection of three members. There's two members in line with each other. Then there's a third member coming in at an angle. Now, let's say there's a force to the right from one of these members and a force to the left from the other. Now, it doesn't matter whether these beams are under tension or compression. All that matters is that we've got two opposing forces acting in line with each other. But watch what happens when we put a force in this third beam. Remember, the total force in any single axis on a truss has to add up to zero. And the issue is, these two members are horizontal members, meaning they can only act horizontally. They can't act vertically. So any force on this joint from this angled member is going to act at least partially in the y-axis. But there's nothing to counteract that force. What that means is we can't have any force in this member right here. It's a zero load member. So let's bring back our truss and I'll show you how to identify the zero load members within this truss. See, we're looking for any two members which are in line with each other with only one member intersecting them, like right here. This member right here comes straight down and intersects these other two that are in line with each other. Now there's no way for this vertical beam to have any load in it without creating a net force on this joint right here, meaning it has to be a zero load member. And here's the key. When analyzing trusses using the method of joints, we can ignore zero force members and act like they're not there. And look at this truss now. You see right here, we now have two members in line with each other. And then this third member is intersecting them at an angle. Now I know the two inline beams are tilted at an angle and not nice and neatly in the horizontal or vertical axis, but that doesn't matter. This one member is intersecting the other two that are in line with each other, meaning this beam right here has to be a zero force member. And at least on this truss, there's a bit of a cascading effect. Once we treat these two beams as though they're not there, this beam becomes a zero load member, which in turn means so does this one, leaving us with a nice simple five member truss. Now you might be tempted to think that this member right here in the middle has no force in it. But if an external force like a support, or in this case, a load acts on what otherwise would have been a zero load member, then we probably don't have a zero load member. In this case, the load is pulling down on this joint right here, which means this center beam has to be pulling up, meaning it's not a zero load member. So the question is, why do we have zero force members in trusses to begin with? And the answer goes back to how members actually work in reality. So if we take a member like this and put it under tension, it's going to have a natural tendency to straighten itself out. Even if I pull at it a bit of an angle, it's going to try to straighten itself out. But if we put a member or a beam like this under compression, it has a tendency to bend. And eventually, if it bends too much, it will buckle. So when designing a truss, especially trusses with long members that are under compression, if you can support those members somewhere along their length, then they'll be less likely to buckle. So there it is. You can identify zero force members by finding two members which are in line with each other, then a third member acting on a joint where they touch. And on that note, that's all for now.